The Book of Recollections, Episode 7, Fire and Steel, by Dysylvania. Back again, are we? I wasn't sure after our last episode, but here you are, yearning for more. Well, have I got tea to spill, so get comfortable because... Uh, hey, hey, what, what are you doing with that? Wait! Looks like somebody got a bit too comfortable. Worry not, no book was harmed during this narration process. So, let's get this show on the road. Within the Firefly Park, our protagonists waited for the arrival of Adam. Meanwhile, Pax handed Jen and Kate their marks of acceptance. Just as food arrived, which, in the Midnight District, consisted mainly of vegetables, Adam made his presence known and the discussion shifted in the direction of the Chancellor. While they talked and filled their bellies, Grace began to run through the streets and alleyways of the Midnight District in the direction of the Firefly Park. Adrenaline made her body tremble and her mind ran wild. Grace's arrival at the Firefly Park marked an end to the tranquility of the group as she began to tell Pax everything she saw. Although her emotions were akin to a volcano on the precipice of erupting, she composed herself before explaining where the two individuals were. After all, the last thing she wanted was to let the civilians hear her conversation and spark chaos. As one might suspect, the group was more than eager to investigate the matter further. But before departing for the dilapidated warehouse, Pax, wanting to reward his newly found friends for joining in his efforts, offered to rent their service on his behalf to make it more of an official matter. This way, if anything inopportune might transpire, at least they would be rewarded. Before rushing towards their location, Pax asked Grace to write down the address of the warehouse so that the barracks could get notified and start mobilizing. While they were readying to leave, Adam was looking through his astral deck of cards. He took out the card which he drew the night before, the throne. He gazed at it and knew it was a gentle nudge from Lunai to aid Pax in defending the city. Grace was leading the group, but at times the favela-like constructions of the Midnight District, which were filled with people celebrating the Night of Lunai, made it slightly difficult for our protagonists to keep Grace in sight. Sprouting out of the crowd, a wrinkled old woman dressed in robes clutched Pax's hand, which caused the half-elf to quickly turn around, but his tension subsided at the sight of her. The woman, a seer, offered Pax three dream whispers and advised him to open them only when astray. For more information on seers, you should check my glossary. Also, look up the terms swindler and oracular. Trust me, they have more things in common than one might think. Now, where did the little old lady go? Oh, never mind. Pax offered one whisper to Grace and another to Adam, relaying the words of the old woman. Making their way through the streets, Genevieve's eyes caught the sight of the Shrine of the Church of Enduring, halting her progress for a few moments. The Dampier's heart was filled with a mixture of sorrow and joy, causing her vision to web, while a silver tear fell down her pale cheek. A moment later, she moved after the others. With the warehouse in sight, Grace touched Pax's shoulder, urging him to be vigilant. As the hand rested on the half-elf's shoulder, his eyes flickered for a fracture of a moment in the colors of the Sabbat water, and, as it dissipated, the half-elf was left feeling more vigilant. The street which housed their objective was sublimely simple in design, and, although not bustling with people, there were some children roaming around and a cloaked figure with a porcelain mask hiding their face. Them? Again? Oh, this does not bode well. In order to make sure that they did not draw the attention of unwanted eyes, the group decided to wait for a few moments and look up and down the length of the street. A tall man with short brown hair, 
piercing green eyes and wearing a leather jacket stopped upon recognizing Grace. The girl would soon make him out to be Cameron Greenhope, a person she hasn't seen in almost two years. Pleasantries were awkwardly exchanged between the two, but the importance of their mission swiftened her interactions with Cameron. The element of surprise was essential, so the group employed subterfuge while making their way towards the building. Adam evoked the aid of his familiar, an albino owl named Haldria, which he directed to circle around the warehouse. Kate and Jen began to climb one of the side walls, seeing an opening lay near the top. The loose structure made it rather troublesome to scale it by using only a rope. Therefore, Jen decided to carry Kate on her back and employ her vampiric powers to safely scale the rest of the structure. As darkness cloaked Genevieve, Kate realized, to her surprise, that her friend seamlessly blended with the surroundings, making her extremely hard to spot. As this happened, Pax and Grace moved in. They looked through the ramshackle window, making sure that they weren't walking into an ambush. Wait, go back a bit. What was the name of the owl? Why does that name sound familiar? Inside the warehouse, all was quiet. The only signs of someone having been there was a splintered chair laying on the ground. Investigating the surroundings, our group found a scroll with a worrying message written in a more cryptic form. In the center of the room, Adam uncovered through magical means a small glyph belonging to the School of Evocation alongside a strange circular emblem, no bigger than a coin. Outside, they could hear the sound of the arriving guards commanding the civilians to get far away from the warehouse. Pax and Grace made their way towards them. As the two began conversing with the guards, an explosion boomed from within the warehouse, causing panic to erupt on the streets. The sudden discharge was the result of Adam, via Mage Hand, touching the emblem. The booby trap seemed to have been devised to get rid of the evidence rather than hurt anyone. As the group reconvened outside, Grace saw Cameron looking at them before running from the scene. Without skipping a beat, Grace followed him and, after a few hundred meters, she managed to intercept him. A heated argument began between the two in which Cameron let out that he worked with the flame, causing Grace to punch him in the face. Oh, you should have been there. Seeing Grace so riled up was a sight to behold. Oh well, of course, nothing stops you from going back and see it for yourself. The fact that Cameron was Grace's best friend not too long ago made her give the man a 5 second head start before continuing the chase. But this was also done in order to allow Grace to find the location of the flame. The ensuing chase led her to the Midnight University and, knowing that she would stand no chance alone, messaged Pax. The paper, as it began to float in the air, took the form of a small griffin. With Grace's address received, the four began to make their way towards the university, but in order to ensure a swift arrival, they asked the guards to hand them a few horses. The sound of hooves echoed upon the cobblestone and the rush of air made their sweat run cold. Gazing at the moon, it seemed as though Lunai directed the group towards the right direction, divine rays of light pointed towards the interior garden of the university. Before meeting up with Grace, Adam employed the help of Halria once more to find the location of flame and scout the vicinity, seeing that within the confines of the interior garden, four individuals waited. One of them had a burlap sack on their head. With no time to waste, the group made their way towards their foe's location where they were greeted by a gruesome sight. As the Chancellor of the Midnight District, Leo Auxilia, sat on his knees awaiting his fate, the flame's sword pierced his body, raising the man a few feet from the ground before being unceremoniously discarded to the ground. As the burlap mask fell from the impact, Genevieve recognized Leo, a former friend she thought lost. This barbaric action sparked the flames of conflict, 
causing the two sides to clash. Oh, my faithful audience, what a battle this was. I'm afraid I won't be able to make it justice, but I shan't leave you hanging. Not even one bit. Kaith made quick work of Cameron, who had thrown his punches at her. She struck his foot with her dagger with such ferocity that the blade came out on the other side, nailing the man in place. Grace summoned the sweetest baby griffin, a creature named Mooney, to engage another follower of the flame, an illuminated orc, as Jen, Pax and Adam assaulted the nemesis. Outnumbered and outmaneuvered, the flame commanded the orc to turn both of them invisible. But in a moment of brilliant creativity, Genevieve threw flower at the flame, making his presence known. Like fairy fire without either fairies or fire. I got to note this spell down for, um, academic purposes, of course. Pax was badly wounded. If it weren't for Mooney, who graciously offered him the healing help he needed. Pax struck his enemy in a spectacular display of raw force, which left the leader of the organization bleeding, and, after jumping into a nearby fountain in order to wash away the flower, turned himself invisible once more. Jen approached the fountain with the intent of attacking, but in doing so, she drew the ire of the enemy who struck at her, breaking bone and causing profound bleeding and severe burns. From the direction of the fountain, Adam saw tiny flames morphing into the air, and seeking to weaken their enemy even further, he cast a lightning spell, electrocuting their hidden foe. A cry of pain came from the fountain, followed by the sound of shambling footsteps as the flame fled to save his own life. As Pax rose up, he rushed in the direction of the footsteps. He entered a nearby hole, but once Kaith eliminated the orc, with a sublimely placed arrow that cleanly passed through his skull, the flame became visible once more, giving Pax an advantage. The two rushed at each other and their blades collided. This offered Adam the opening to rush over to Jen and stabilize her with the help of Lunai. Grace directed Mooney towards Jen and the touch of the companion brought the Dampier back to consciousness. But back in the garden, which now lost some of its splendor due to the combat. Jen rushed towards Leo's body and she began to utter the prayer of enduring towards Obscuro, urging the deity to allow her friend to return. Silvery tears ran down her pale cheeks like rushing rivers as she saw a wound at the back of Leo's head shining with a silvery shimmer, a sign that this prayer to bring him back to life had been performed once before. The ritualistic energy around her began to swirl before reaching its apex and dissipating, as if something was missing, as if the prayer went wrong. Genevieve breathed heavily, waiting for something, anything, to happen. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Thirty seconds passed. Her hands were trembling. This was the recap for episode 7 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Count Bear, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, Vim, the Tale of Immortality, tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash at Dicelvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us, and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!